something to help each other. Welcome to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski, and boy, do we have a wonderful show to you for you today about healthy pets. Let's welcome Tony Shalaski from Healthy Pets Products. Thanks, Ed. Welcome, Tony. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. You have your, your hands on, on the foundation of, of health for our pets, and, and that's reflected in the store that you founded how many years ago now? Eleven. Eleven years. I remember 11. when you first opened your doors. You had your first store called Healthy Pet Products where in, in the North Hills? Correct, in McCandless Township. And then you started to branch out and came to the South Hills. Mm -hmm. That was, I came to the South Hills in 2011. And that store was located where? So that was at the intersection of, that was diagonally across the street from South Hills Village. Village. In Upper St. Clair. In Upper St. Clair. And then you moved your store here to Peters Township. So we came four miles south to Peters Township. And you know, a store right on 19. Mm -hmm. So wh what was the motivation for you to begin to s open up a pet store? Because that's a big competitive business, mm -hmm. especially with all the big box stores that are out there. Sure. They have great buying power as far as cost and so forth. Mm -hmm. what, what motivated you to open up Healthy Pet Products? Um, I really feel it's a mission-based, mission um, mission-driven business. Um, I was a pet sitter prior to owning Healthy Pet Products, so I saw a lot of health issues with dogs and cats, and I just felt the need was there for education, because even though there are a lot of pet food stores um, in the area, all over the world, everywhere, um, not many of them are mission-driven, and not many of them are education-based. We're more education-based, um, health and wellness-based, rather than um, profit. Driven. Well, hopefully you make a profit because you got to stay in business. I had, I, yes. Everybody's got to eat. Yes. But I, I understand that motivation because that's what really prompted me into that, seeing all of the problems that are being that are occurring with these animals, mm -hmm. and a lot of it based on nutrition and the lack of it. Yep. And you, I know you. I've known you for years, and you've taken it upon yourself to educate yourself on the importance of nutrition. And it's interesting. Your the, the name of your store, Healthy Pet Products, and I had my supplement that I made for years called Healthy Pet Systems. <laughs> and, and we kind of used, you used orange and green and I used orange and, and a kind of a bluish purple. So uh -huh. it's kind of funny. Yep. But it, it goes to tell you where your, where your concepts begin and that's with that healthy pet. Yep. Because pets are not healthy these days. There, there are a lot of problems. they are not. The, the per medical profession, the veterinarian profession mimic each other in their mm -hmm. approach. So it's about pills and surgeries and vaccinations, same way that we do it. Yep. And no one is discussing this concept of feeding the body and making it become well on its own. Right. So your, your products and your, as far as food goes, let's talk about that because you have a, a variety of foods and I get my food from, from you as well. Mm -hmm. But you have everything from kibble mm -hmm. to grain free to raw and so forth. So l let's talk about this nutrition and why you bring the products into the store that you do. So um, I like to offer as wide a variety from an economic standpoint as possible um, so that as many people in the area that I can, I wanna, I wanna reach as many people as I can no matter what economic background they have so that they can afford to feed better food opposed to having to go to the grocery store and get very low quality food. Um, so that's why there's kind of a broad range and category wise, and I'll rank these from best to least, um, raw, I carry raw, and which is the best from a category standpoint. Next is freeze dried raw, dehydrated. Um, there's also air dried raw, um, and then we have canned, and then we have kibble. Okay, let's start off with that raw. Yeah. And I've, I've purchased this product from Healthy Pets, and I used it for, uh, well, since I've been back, actually. Sure. From, from Arizona, which is going on almost three years now, wow. coming up two and a half years. So you had this, this new raw f food that's frozen, mm -hmm. that's sourced locally. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. So the local one that we have is Answers Pet Food. 
Um, they are located in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania. Um, and the interest they're, they're definitely, I feel, leading the ind industry from a food science background. Um, they use fermentation in their foods. So that's good bacteria. Products. Good bacteria to help control the bad bacteria. All of our raw meats have some level of bad bacteria. Um, so the fermentation part helps to control that. And th that's done in the state of Pennsylvania? Yes. Uh, by, is it, if I recall, the Amish? Um, so they, it's a family-based business. The family is not Amish, um, but they have uh, hired um, an Amish gentleman that owns the farm and they built a packing facility and processing facility on the farm. So they're raising the, the source and then yes. processing it right on they site. They raise almost all of their own animals uh, on site. Everything is processed on site. Um, so as, from a quality standpoint, you, there's nothing that beats them. So what makes raw your first choice? Um, well, um, I feel that it's the first choice and the best choice because it's what they would naturally eat in the wild. Um, it's more bioavailable to them. Um, there are no starches in it, so they don't become overweight, yeah. which leads to a multitude of other problems. There's no inflammatory response from a sugar spike. So one so. of the big things with raw is the digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. And when you're eating anything processed, those are baked out, cooked out. Correct, yep. And so you're getting, like you mentioned, the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. and, and pathogenic or bad, what we call bad bacteria, really isn't necessarily bad for you if it's kept in check. Correct. And the addition of that good bacteria does that, as you mentioned, and then helps with digestion as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're eating that raw food, you're getting the digestive enzymes mm -hmm. along with, with the good bacteria. Yep. And you, just to make the audience understand, bacteria really isn't the culprit. It's the byproducts, the metabolites that are produced. They're toxins. They're called endotoxins and, and by bacteria. And that's what makes you sick. Yep. So what happens if, there's, if that balance that you mentioned isn't there, you get too much bad bacteria or these pathogenic bacteria and those, myco, those uh, endotoxins, mycotoxins are produced by fung fungi, but endotoxins actually produce the sickness that we get, the illness. That's why if you cook meat and it was bad, you would think, well, we killed the bacteria, then we can eat it. Mm -hmm. But we can't because the toxins don't get affected by heat. Right. You know, so, so I think that's a, a, a powerful uh, understanding that people need to have. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens when you start to feed pe uh, dogs these raw, raw foods? So um, we get a multitude of different changes in animals um, and positive feedback from their parents. Um, they drink less water. Um, I actually, I usually warn people when switching from a kibble to raw food that don't be alarmed if your dog or cat stops drinking water because there's moisture in the food right. opposed to kibble being completely void of moisture. Um, so they have cleaner teeth, fresher breath, um, their body mass is just leaner and more muscular opposed to roly-poly, lumpy kind mm -hmm. of animal vitality brighter eyes shiny shinier coat it really does impact the coats a lot yes and i'm sure that the groomers that come into the store and talk to you about it are big advocates of this raw food as well yep some are yeah. for sure because you you can really see those changes in yes. the coats yes so is there a, t a technique that you have to implement when you're going from let's say kibble which to me is the worst food out there mm -hmm. but uh, if you have your animal on kibble and you're going to switch this raw, is there a technique that you have to follow a protocol? Well, there is, um, and it depends on the animal, of course. If they're extra sensitive, we recommend a gradual, slow transition. Um, f if they are pretty hardy digestively, we normally recommend one meal kibble, one meal raw for a couple of days. And then usually within a couple of days, they're switched over, no issues. 
Yeah, you know, I, I get this question a lot from people because people know how involved I am with animals yep. and their well-being. And uh, I always say an older animal that you switch takes longer to switch over. Yep. And a, a younger animal, you could switch a little quicker. A sick animal that's having problems, you need to be a little more delicate and take sure. some more time. A healthy, robust one-year-old, you probably can integrate. And, you know, I've had a number of rescue dachshunds over, over my time. Mm -hmm. And when I changed the, the garbage food that they were on from the places they came from and put them right in the, to raw, and I, I kind of use a lot of freeze-dried raw, as you know. Yep. Um, I, I did it within a day and sure. never saw issues. The biggest issues you see would, are what? If you make that switch too, too quick. Um, you might see a little bit of diarrhea. You might see a little bit of, you could see a little bit of throwing up. Um, but honestly, I, we rarely hear issues. We hear more issues about people trying to switch from one kibble to another than we do from switching from kibble to raw. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. That's my observation as well. I, I think it's important to always err on the side of safety. Oh, definitely. You know, so, you know, like I mentioned those older dogs, my protocol and rec my recommendation, of course, I always have to preface that with, you need to talk with your veterinarian uh -huh, about that. Me too. But um, uh, on an older dog or a sick dog, I like to see that change over a month. Yeah. And, and my recommendation sure. is you, you take your food that you're currently mixing it and cut it in half and add some some raw to mm -hmm. it and you do that for a week yep and then uh, next week you cut that back again by half and then the third week you cut that again by half and then by the fourth week you you could probably be on yep a totally raw food that that's probably the safest way yep for, for certain animals to do that so do you have other forms of this raw food in the store besides the one you mentioned? We have many brands. Um, I mean, it's it's a growing market. So there's there every year there's some new brands on the market. Um, so we have plenty of space for raw food. Um, so we have other brands as well, not just Answers Pet Food. So the Answers Pet Food is frozen and it's in your case. Are, are all the raw foods frozen? Yes. Yes. And do you have, how long does it take to thaw those out? So it depends on the form. A lot of them make them in eight ounce patties and or one ounce little nuggets. Yeah, so that's what I like, the one ounce little nuggets Because you have small, small dog. dogs, yeah. right. And honestly, it depends on, you know, exactly what you just said, whether what people want, depending on their size of animal. Um, I have two 40 pound dogs, so I typically, and I we advise people on how to get into a routine it's no different than getting into a routine with home cooking but um i take out two patties every other day so i take two patties out and i have it thawed in their own container ready to go and then as soon as those two patties are done i take two more patties out and and that's pretty much what i did as well yeah i, I would actually unbox the patties from the box that they came in and put them in freezer bags. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, uh, m m my so reason for that is because yeah. So I, I did a pre-portion. Yeah. And then that box doesn't seal tight. Right. You know, so that if they're in there too long, you get freezer burn and so yeah. forth. So I thought it was just added measure of sure. protection. Yeah. And the, the night before, I'd take them out. Mm -hmm. And then they were and leave them in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. In that baggie. Mm -hmm. And so for a couple of days, I had patties. You know, and I just kept that routine going. Sure and it worked out really well. So it's really no effort. Mm -mm. I, is it a little more expensive? It is a little <laughs> bit more expensive, um, but you, what you put in, you get out. So you save in other ways. I always say that, you know, you're gonna pay it one way or another. Yeah. You're gonna pay it in vet bills and yeah. have a sick dog that traumatizes your animal, or, or your, you, I'm speaking of dogs and cats here because raw is fantastic for cats as well. Mm -hmm. or, you, or you're gonna pay it to the vet and you're yep. gonna have emotional stress as, as well. You know, you, I tell you, probably next to a baby being ill, a sick animal affects you so much because uh -huh. you feel helpless, Sure. you know? And you don't want to be in that state. It all starts with nutrition. Yeah. So you're getting these animals that 
that are of course giving up their lives to feed to feed our pets. That's mm -hmm. the way the system works, because these dogs and cats aren't vegetarians by any means. No. And they have to have animal protein, and they make this patty. The the answers or answers the answers of my my the station the radio shows on, but answers pet food actually mixes some eggs in there and and oh, other yeah. and and some vegetables. Yep. So they're they're getting a well balanced diet. Definitely. And, and more of a natural approach. Mm -hmm. So, Rob being the best, mm -hmm. second best? Freeze dried. So, what's the difference between raw and freeze dried raw? So, they take the raw product and they put it through a freeze dryer, which makes it shelf stable. So, it sits on a, so that sits on a shelf in a bag. And I think it, it's growing as quickly as the raw food category, if not quicker. And to be honest with you, it is more expensive than if you fed frozen raw. But I think it's growing because from a mental standpoint, the consumer still feels like it's, um, they're still scooping out of a bag. So it's not as, um, it's not as much of a leap to go into the freezer. And that's, a, I think, a lot of the reason why it came to be was to kind of bridge people into the freezer. Well, what's interesting is you can't travel with the frozen patties. Yes, And I correct. travel a lot. Yes. And so my technique was, well, for years I made my own food. Yep. I mean, I made my own food for probably 15, 20 years because you couldn't find nice food. I know, food out. I it did was, it, it for about 10. It, it, was all, it was all garbage, everything, yeah. everything you saw and everything you looked at. So once I started to see this quality of food changing in the pet industry, and actually Healthy Pet Products is the first place that I noticed this, this change happening because you couldn't go to the box stores. I mean, I had experience going to the box store one time. There was a particular biscuit that I purchased all the time. Uh -huh. And I walked in there and I said, where would I find this? Well, we don't carry that. I went, I've been buying it here, but I couldn't find it on right, the shelves. Right. They had moved it. Uh -huh. The lack of personal touch there, they didn't even know what product they were selling. I found it eventually because I knew I was purchasing it from this big box sure. store. You know, That doesn't happen at, at Healthy Pet Products. No. Every one of your employees knows what's, what's on their shelves and what they do actually because you're constantly educating them. I've attended some of your, your programs that you've had there. So. Getting, getting back to this freeze-dried and, and raw food, you can't travel with this raw food. So I went to the freeze-dried, and I was already giving a particular soft biscuit that's actually the same, it's the same formula yeah. Yeah. as the, what I'm feeding them, feeding Tucker uh, as, a, as a patty. But I travel a lot, and I needed something that I could take along with me, mm -hmm. and something that was working yep. as far as nutrition goes, and that's why I switched. Although at home, I would integrate the raw food mm -hmm. you know, as well. For example, his first breakfast is, his breakfast in the morning is, is, is an egg. Nice. I cook him an egg, and he, he looks forward to that every morning. I'm sure. So we have eggs together. And then I, I use the freeze-dried product. Uh-huh. One of the things that I do is when I break that up, I mix it with a little bit of water. Yes. And I let it sit for five, seven minutes, and then I squeeze the excess water out and then he devours it. Nice. So you're now able to give this nutrition that requires, that your animal requires. You know, I often say, and I coined this 20 some years ago, although I'm starting to hear it out there now, I've never seen a dog attack a cornfield. Yeah. Yet, corn is one of the biggest products inside most of pet food, and yeah. we're gonna talk to that when, about that when we get down to kibble. So you have, you've seen the surge in freeze-dried, mm -hmm. and there are a number of companies now venturing into mm -hmm. freeze-dried. Are these all done within the United States, or, or some mm -hmm. of them come from other, product, other countries? No, the, uh, everybody, everybody in the frozen and freeze-dried category is U.S. Yeah, especially on my shelves. Well, uh, and that's a good point. You mentioned that right now. You go out of your way to make sure that things are sourced as much as you can within the United States right. or North America. North America. A lot is North America. Um, the only thing we see a lot of is New Zealand. 
um, which is quality. Oh, you, you can't get better, exactly. better meat. Uh, New Zealand will not even allow our feed for their animals in their country to, yeah. or, or any of our animals to go to their country. Yeah. Yeah. They won't even let a dog in their country. Huh, in Australia I didn't and know New that. Zealand. Yeah, you can't bring a dog in. Interesting. Yeah, they're very protective of, of their... They uh, should be. Because that, that is their biggest industry. Yeah. So, you know you're getting a quality mm -hmm. piece of meat when it's coming from New Zealand. Yep. So, there are issues from certain countries that you have to, you have to watch. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a lot of loopholes that you that the average consumer doesn't realize that can be done in the pet food industry. So um, those are the kind of things that we really watch for that a lot of people have no idea. It can, it can say made in the USA, but that does not mean the ingredients in that product are sourced in the USA. Yeah. It, or they can source them in the USA and process them in another country. And bring them back. And bring them back, and yep. they'll have to identify that they did that. Yep. There was a there was a big thing. There's something um, that is put into fish meal. Yeah. And um, I'm not, I'm not going to give a big story on that, but it's mandated by by uh, it's a preservative. Yeah. Because the ships where they process fish meal, because you have to make it immediately, otherwise the, the fish spoil. The ships were exploding. So they put this preservative in there to prevent that explosion. So any manufacturer that's making making pet food with fish in it doesn't have to identify it unless they add it. Right. So that doesn't mean it's not in there. In fact, it's by maritime law is in there, right. but it doesn't have to be listed on the label. Absolutely. So you really have to have to know what you're doing, what you're buying and and who's educating you. Right. You know, so and I think your store takes a lot of that guesswork out of there. Uh, you know, we've uh, we both I lecture every year at Super Zoo and every year I see Tony there. In fact, I've seen her at my lecture. Um, you're, you keep your, your thumb on the pulse of things and knowing what's, what's out there, how, where it comes from, and how it's made. That's not going to happen in a big box store. No. Um, I mean, I think that the boardroom in a big box store is more about where can we make more money opposed to which products have decreased in quality that need to be replaced and move off of our shelves and what do we need to bring in that is a higher quality so um yeah so you mentioned a little bit about this freeze-dried product and air dried tell us the difference in those two so the air dried and that's what i travel with i travel with zwe peak which is made in new zealand um and an air dried product so they basically take it's kind of between freeze drying and dehydrated they basically take their raw product, kind of roll it out um, onto big sheets and slowly air dry it at a low temperature. And then it, it's cut into, so it almost is like a, in a jerky form. Um, a lot of, I use it for traveling. A lot of trainers even use the food as training treats, um, but it's cut into the, all these little small squares. So again, it's kind of a, definitely a better product than kibble, but shelf stable, um, and you know. So they're they're getting the the nutrition yep. because it's not baked out. Correct. And then a bunch of fillers on that. What are fillers? Fillers are any any type of starch that makes a binder that makes that stuff crunchy. Yeah. So. We hit raw, yep. freeze dried, air dried raw. What's the next level? So the next level we go to is canned food, dehydrated. No, dehydrated's next. Okay, what's what's dehydrated? So dehydrated is similar to the freeze drying process, but it's dehydrated in a dehydrator and literally like a powdered form, and then you add water to it and it hydrates to like an oatmeal consistency, and that is what you feed. Dehydrated often has, uh, my observation, they yeah. add a lot of vegetables and fruits they and, do. and other things. And uh, some potatoes. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of potatoes yeah. in, in dog food whatsoever, actually. I'm not yeah. even a big fan of rice in dog food. Agreed. So, um, y you know, a dog out in the wild, mm -hmm. We'll get a little bit of stomach contents, but, mm -hmm. but they don't, you know, they're not going to attack a plant or, right. or, like I say, an ear of corn. 
they've over over time have adapted to eating stomach contents, but those stomach contents are usually grasses, not wheat, not corn. You know, the grasses, a few vegetables, a few berries. berries. You know, that's that's what the animals that they would attack are eating. Right. A cat won't even eat the stomach of, a, right. of an animal. Right. So we, you know, I'll hear experts talking about. Uh, having grain in the food. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about grain mm -hmm. with kibble. And there's this big push going around now, and I've heard a veterinarian on, on TV, on the news talking mm -hmm. about this, that not feeding your dog grain is causing dogs, young dogs, to die of heart problems. Mm -hmm. And so their, their, their statement is you need to feed, not feed grain-free free food, and feed food that has grain in there, otherwise your dog's gonna have a heart attack and die. It's such a lie. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a blatant lie yeah. on TV. Yeah. What what the problem is is lack of taurine. Right. There's not a a speck of taurine in the grain. Correct. And they they're promoting grain food food as though there's taurine in it basically. Correct. Where you get taurine is high quality meat based food. Correct, because it's an amino acid. It's an amino acid. Yes. So so you you have uh, experts that are trained veterinarians. Yep. And they're buying into a, to a false concept. They are being pushed by maybe the manufacturers of junk food. Right. So, so you really got to watch shows like this and listen to me on Healthy Pets, Healthy People on, on my radio program because these are things that we talk about from time to time. Mm -hmm. We try to correct the errors. Now we're not always 100% right either, but the minute we find out we're not, we're we're changing our our tune. Correct. But I I was really upset to hear this. Yes, we hear it all day from customers. Because there's a, there's a push, and it's gotta be this, this manufacturer to stay away from grains and go yeah. to grain-free, but I'm gonna tell you what, in my opinion, grain-free isn't the answer either. I agree. You know, and, and we're gonna take a break here in a minute, Tony, and when we come back, let's, let's dwell into that a little bit, okay. because I, I think it's so important to clear up these myths and misconceptions mm -hmm. that are out there. Mm -hmm and people are actually hurting their animals and not helping them by these blatant mistruths. Absolutely. You know, all for the sake of the dollar, I guess. I don't know. But, but anyway, we'll be back here in a minute on Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners with Tony Shalaski from Healthy Pet Products. We are talking right now nutrition for your dogs and your cats. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski and Tucker and I welcome you back from that little break that we had to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners and we're talking with Tony Shalaski from Healthy Pet Products. And before the break, we were really deep into this nutrition because it is so important what we're feeding our dogs and cats. And we left talking about the hydrated, dehydrated food. Mm -hmm. And uh, wh what does that really consist of, Tony? So the dehydrated food is a combination. Um, they do two main things. They'll do a base mix, which does not include meat, because some people like to buy their own meats and incorporate it into a food and still want to be able to make it balanced, so it makes it a little easier for them. And then they also do a complete and balanced one with meat, fruits, vegetables. Um, some have potatoes or oats or something in there. Um, and some supplements to kind of round it all out. And then you left talking about canned food. We just brought up canned food. Right. So what, what exactly is canned food? Uh, so it basically is, um, most of those also are complete and balanced, but there are some that are just a, fed as sup, used as supplemental feeding. But it's basically food put into a can and gone through a canning process in the can. It's usually cooked in the can. What, what, these cans are made out of tin generally? Yeah, they're and aluminum cans with, um, and aluminum cans have to have some type of coating, so then you have to find out if it's, the coating is BPA free. Because um, that coating will leach into the food once it's heated. Sure. 
and as they bake it in that can. Yep, yep. Interesting process, huh? Yes. So are all canned foods equal? No, there's definitely higher levels of cans and lower lower levels of cans based on any fillers they put in them or, you know. You bring up fillers. Would you define what a filler is? Um, I guess a filler would be anything a dog would not naturally eat in the wild. So, I mean, even something like oats and rice and potatoes, potatoes. and um, vegetable and fruit matter can somewhat be considered filler. Um, so... So the biggest thing with canned food is you get a lot of moisture. Right, right, which is beneficial. That's why it, that's why it's categorized above kibble, um, because kibble is void of all moisture, so it dehydrates your pet. So let's talk about let's ease into kibble now. Not my favorite choice of food right. at all. I mean, if your animal's starving, there you go. But but what is kibble? Um, kibble is a dry food um, and when we say kibble I mean that's what it's called it's not we're not calling out any brand or anything like that it's just dry food in a bag that has been high pressure cooked to the point that it can sit shelf stable for up to two years on a shelf that should say a lot right there it should say that says a lot and, and the interesting thing here with the process of kibble is you have to either you have to have some form of starch uh -huh. sugar in kibble so that either has to be a high grain content or it has to be a high sugar content right otherwise kibble cannot be made correct because you need a starch to create a binder any baker any cook knows that and then th this stuff is all processed and then extruded through a machine mm -hmm. to those little shapes mm -hmm. and then often it's loaded with preservatives correct also Rancid oils, right? You know, and I'm sure Tony knows this. All these restaurants that are mm -hmm. on every street corner, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. they use grease of some form, mm -hmm. whether it be vegetable oils or or lard or whatever. That gets dumped into a barrel, and that barrel sits out until it's full, no matter what the weather is, whether it's 105 degrees or whether it's 30 below. And then a rendering company comes and picks those barrels up and they actually use that fat, this rancid fat, to squirt onto the kibble in order to make it palatable for the animals to even want to eat it. Correct. So, you know, we got to think of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so grain is good for our dogs and our cats? No. No. You know, we kind of alluded to that er early on um, with the taurine and so forth. Uh, you know what's interesting is animals, us included, protein isn't really what we utilize. We break that protein down into amino acids and then reassemble those amino acids. So if those amino acids are not in what we're eating, we're not doing that. Right. And some of them are called essential amino acids. There are about 20 of them out there that you only get from diet. Holds true for our dogs and cats. So if you have a high grain or a high sugar product, where are they getting those amino acids? Exactly. They're not. They're not. You know. So, but some people only want to feed their dog kibble for convenience. Right. Or, th and they don't know there's alternatives. And then a lot of people say, well, I have a large dog and I can't afford. Right. But the interesting thing is you can actually feed your dog less quality, uh, less quantity when you right. have a quality food. Right. And there are ways that you can do it somewhat economically. I encourage people to do as much fresh food at home as possible. And then if you have to, you can then mix some of this, yeah. this other food. Yeah. So in, in this kibble, which we keep stating has to be high grain or high sugar, one or the other. Right. So what's the difference between, uh, you can have kibble that's grain uh -huh. kibble or kibble that's grain free kibble? So the grain free ones, the binders that have been used um, when grain-free really started to pick up um, in the early 2000s, their, their first starch of choice was potatoes. So we saw a lot of potatoes in kibble instead of rice, oats, barley, wheat, corn, whatever. Um, so then they were worried about the sugar load, the, the glycemic index of the potatoes, because that has a tendency to be high. 
Um, and then we s were seeing that some dogs were allergic to potatoes. So they started incorporating legumes, peas, um, and some different sorghum. We're seeing sorghum. Um, one manufacturer does millet. There's only one manufacturer that uses millet, so, which is classified as a seed. It's not a grain. Um, so that's what we're seeing now. So when I have conversations with people, and I, I get these throughout the week, mm -hmm. um, emails and phone calls, and they, they have health issues, and my first question is, what are you feeding? And sure. Then, and then we talk about the different types of foods out there. And they say, well, I look at the ingredients, and it says first, first ingredient is chicken. Mm -hmm. And then the, what's the second ingredient? Corn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in all actuality, there's probably more corn in there than, than chicken, first right. of all, uh, because it's done chicken as wet weight right. and corn is dry weight. Right. So you'll, you'll get less chicken that weighs more, you know, so, but according to weight, they're, they're labeling it correctly. Correct. And, and then chicken kind of means to us, you know, roasted chicken on the rotisserie, mm -hmm. a, a chicken leg, mm -hmm. a chicken wing, a chicken breast. That doesn't necessarily mean what's in that chicken for that for that for that kibble. Right. So that that chicken could be anything from what. Uh, the the cancered tumored parts that are cut off, um, the heads, the feet, the wings, um, the f the feathers, feathers, the beaks, the beaks. Um, That's all in the dog food industry. Chicken. Everything that basically is cut off of any animal. To, to in order for that animal to stay in the human food industry um, is going to be cut off, thrown into a barrel, and then put into the pet food industry. That's why they're able to make a 50-pound bag of food for $30. All right. So they go th you go through this list of ingredients, and you see things like uh, animal byproduct. What's that? So when you don't have an identified meat source, that's even scarier because animal byproduct could be from any animal, even roadkill, road kill, even euthanized dogs, cats, horses. And why is that a problem? Um, so, well, the roadkill, because it's been, I mean, how many times have you passed the deer on the road that's been sitting there for two weeks, yeah. bloated and smelly, full of maggots? Um, euthanized dogs and cats and horses because that meat has that euthanasia drug, and pet food has been tested, even by the FDA, and has tested positive for ethoxiquin. Etho uh, no, not, not ethoxiquin. Not ethoxiquin was the, <laughs> was the, the preservative, the preservative on, the, on yeah. the fish. Pentobarbital yeah. um, is proven positive with, for pentobarbital, which is the drug they use to euthanize the, our animals. I, I know a, a guy who, when he was in college, that was his job. That's how he supported himself while he was in school, was to go around to all the veterinarian offices and gather up the euthanized oh. dogs that he took to rendering plants. Oh. So it's, it's pretty darn scary. Then you add up that, and you add up rancid oil, right. uh, all these grains, lack of quality meat nutrition. Right. Um, what are you feeding? What are you feeding your dog when you're buying something off of a shelf that you don't know what's in there? And you really have to self-educate. Mm -hmm. Watch shows like this. Mm -hmm. Go to pet stores like Healthy Pet Products where mm -hmm. people are educated in how to read a label and know what's actually in there. Right. What's a meal when you see that word M-E-A-L? So <laughs> there's conflicting information like there is with almost anything anymore, but um, meal, is when water has been removed from the meat. So if you see chicken meal, that means it's basically already been cooked and the water is no longer in there. And you can't make a kibble without a type of meal. That's another requirement. All kibble has meal in it. Right. So of some form. Right. You know, so a lot of this is dictated by the manufacturing process. Absolutely, whether yes. you get a quality yes. nutritional food or, or not. So when people, they love to read that list and they'll go, well, it has vitamin E and vitamin this and this. They put such minute amounts of that stuff in there. Uh -huh. 
and it's always stuck on at the end with the heating process and that rancid oil. That's when they don't, it's not in the food, it's attached to the food right. uh, in kibble. Right. And uh, you're really getting nothing. Right. I always tell people that's not the most important. That's important. Look at that nutritional panel. They'll go, what's that? What is a nutritional panel on a, on a bag of food or a can of food? It's not a lot, I can tell you that. <laughs> But what, what, what do they usually list? Uh, protein, fat, and fiber. And moisture. And moisture. And so, so you really have to base your, your decisions not only on the list of ingredients and understanding that, but what that, that nutritional panel mm -hmm. says. And you'll see, like canned food is probably 90% moisture. Mm -hmm. Dry food is... 10? Well, if ten. that. And, and it's fiber mostly. Right. Not not protein, but fiber. So one of the one of the big things you'll notice when you switch from this junk food to the quality of food is the stool size, smell, and shape changes. Yep. So you get less of all all of less that. Less of it. And less clean up and so forth because your dog's able to utilize that protein Correct. and not have all those byproducts that are waste that they Correct. have to eliminate. You know. So really, you have to know. Yes. You know. So I always tell everybody, uh, uh, everybody I get an opportunity to talk to about, and I, and I do this on Healthy Pets, Healthy People on the radio, look at that nutritional panel and take that, that first ingredient, protein. Mm -hmm. You get it in percent form and you add it up to the next ingredient, which is usually fiber and usually fat. And then you add the fiber and mm -hmm. you add the moisture and you'll get a number, let's say 70%, that's your, you get 70 you take 100, subtract 70, the rest of that is sugar. It's a carbohydrate. Yep. And if you look at some of these foods, they're 80, 90% sugar. Yep. Now the one I buy from Healthy Pet Products is 7% sugar. So, and that's, that's by natural vegetables and, and berries. Sure. You know, which is not a refined sugar. Correct. Like the grains or the added actual sugar right. that they put in. So again, I, I know you, you, people come in and say, what, what is this nutritional panel? You get a lot of people asking about that. They look at that ingredient list and that's what they're looking for. And a lot of times they just look at like the first couple ingredients. And that, or, and or the blurbs on the front of the package. Oh yeah, oh, that's, they, they look at the front of the package and it says lamb. They automatically think, oh, there's no chicken in there. Absolutely not the case. You have to turn the bag around and look at every single ingredient. Yeah, every single one, absolutely. And then take that nutritional panel. Again, it's, it's, it's a barcoded panel. It's on, the, on a package somewhere. Take that first ingredient, protein, add the fat, add the, the fiber and the moisture, get a total, subtract that from 100, and that'll tell you how much sugar is in the food you're feeding. Our dogs and our cats cannot process sugar. Correct. They can't. They don't, uh, there's no, there's no benef nutritional benefit to sugar for them whatsoever. So, and all that does is create a fatty liver in their, in their issue, in their body, and diabetes and cancers, which are all on the uptake with, Way with, uptake. with their animals. Way up. You know, 20 some years ago when I started lecturing on, on pet food, and I did that nationally, I would take a well-known, well-advertised, beautiful bag of kibble and hold it up. And my first words out of my mouth were, your dog would probably get more nutrition from the bag than they yeah. from the food. Yeah. Which would always get a chuckle, and that's not true, but that was, you know, just something to break the ice to make sure. people understand that what was in this bag right. was worthless. Yep. You know. So to recap mm -hmm. on nutrition, most important thing you can do for your dog. Absolutely. And the best nutrition source is? Raw food. Raw food. Real food. Real food. Yep. So I hope that was educational for everybody. You know, I, Tony and I could talk for hours on this stuff, and, and, and it really holds true. What you feed, what you put in, is what you're going to get out. Yep. You know, so we were talking about sourcing. Yeah. And that's a big thing with you. And we've had conversations over the years of, of products that you bring in your store, and you're very selective. Mm-hmm. So what's some of the problems in sourcing from other countries? We don't know. Um, we don't know how, um, how many pesticides they're using, what pesticides and herbicides they're using. Are they sitting rotten in the bottom of a ship crossing 
the ocean. Um, they're just, they're, they're standards of growing and raising animals um, are different. They're not obligated by our laws and our, Correct. Uh, that we've established in this country at all. And we're lax on some things. And, Absolutely. And they have no regulation, basically. Right. You know, um, I think every scare that's happened where dogs have become sick and ill was all food sourced from China, if I recall. Every, every case was a, was a sourced food from China, if, I'm, if my memory yeah. serves me right. Yeah. There's yeah. been so many, it's hard to... Yeah, there's actually sites out there now that, that you can go check for recalls. Okay. They're, they're so prevalent. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's why you, you've always got to go to put things on your side of the, of the checklist in your right. favor, you know, and, and know what you're, you're sourcing. And you do that even with toys. Yeah, we, we try to, it's difficult, but we try to get only USA made toys. Um, there's like a handful of manufacturers that do that. Um, so we sell all of those, but then we also, anything imported, they can do um, independent heavy metal testing. Um, or, you know, you find out if the fabrics are new or used, a lot of times they're just remnants of of things that have been sitting in factories um, overseas. So um, a lot of the other toys that we have that are imported are tested. We have one manufacturer that makes um, baby toys and they make pet food toys and all that has to be tested. Because one of the problems is lead. Correct. Because they're making these attractive for Correct. you. Your, your dog doesn't care what color that toy is. Correct and they put lead in order to have the paint stay on the on the product right and then as your dog's chewing on that or your baby for that matter they're ingesting that lead right and we all know the stories the horror stories about lead you know i think there was even a dog food manufacturer that was putting little bits of rubber in their in their food or oh, plastics or something yeah you know at one time so you you really yeah you really got to know what you're doing and then you have a lot of specialty items in the store, even as far as leads go and so forth. Sure, and harnesses, tons of different types of harnesses and leads and um, harnesses to help dogs with pulling leads that have bungee cords in them so that when the dog jerks, you know, the your shoulder doesn't get ripped out of its socket. Yeah. Um, there's so many um, great products on the market. They, to help you have a better relationship with your dog yeah, you or want, cat. You, you brought that animal in, in your house to love and take care of it and be loved by it. Yeah. And, and you want to do whatever you can right. to, to ensure that. Right. You know, and it's, right. it's work. It's it is work. Absolutely work to, to make sure you're providing the right products in the right environment. You brought some things here that are kind of neat. And this, this is called the fun feeder. So would you explain this to us? So on the topic of ask, expecting our animals to live in our homes with us, um, we hear a lot of anxiety, destruction, um, even with cats misbehaving. Um, so they need, they would have constant stimulation out in the wild. They'd be running, hunting, doing what they would normally do. And in our homes, they're not doing that. So they're they're having anxiety, maybe also because of the sugar load in their food, sure. but um, we still have to help them adapt to our environment. So there's so many different things on the market to help them do that. Like instead of throwing food in a bowl, you can throw in it, throw it in this little maze and they have to work at, work at getting it out of there. Um, so. And then this, this says, this fun feeder, Tony says, helps prevent canine obesity and bloat. So we know obesity is a problem and that's a lot to do with grains and sugars. Yes. And, and you mentioned this great thing. Dogs in the wild, they hunt, they eat, they rest, they move again, hunt, eat, yep. and rest. At home, they eat and rest right. a lot. So we know, we can understand, especially if you're feeding a high carbohydrate diet, uh, we know why there's obesity, but what's bloat? So bloat is when they are ingesting all the food very quickly, no matter what food actually, 
and then air builds up in the system because it's it's trying to figure out what to do with all that food it just took in because they would naturally kind of like eat a little bit at a time so this slows them down so it reduces the possibility of bloat and if you see a dog acting funny or its belly is starting to expand like a balloon or the dog is whining and moving side to side or, or acting abnormally yep you need to take that dog to emergency vet immediately because that dog could die in five minutes. That's how serious bloat is. Yep. And uh, if you've ever experienced it, you don't want to experience it again. It is a life-threatening event. So I think anything that you can do, one of the things I do, because certain breeds, dachshunds included, are prone to bloat. And it's a lot with this barrel chest design mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so forth is I feed them small miles, small meals throughout the day, not one big meal, but they eat three times a day. Well, now I just have Tucker, but, but Tucker eats three meals a day, small meals a day, mm -hmm. and gets treats in between. Now the treats aren't grain treats, they're actually the same food um, that I feed them. They right. just make the same food into treats. And uh, that's, that's one way to help, help prevent this bloat type thing, as is raw food. Sure because of the good bacteria and right. so forth. If you're not able to do all of that, this is a great alternative to yep. help that. Yep. And, and then you say it's entertaining as well. It, it provides them some mental stimulation. And then what is this one, Tony? This is uh, that one rock will, and bull. Yeah, so that's interesting because it'll rock back and forth and then there's holes inside that they have to get the dry food out of. Or you could do the freeze dried in the little bits in this too. So, but it rocks back and forth and they have to work at getting it out. So it's fun feeding. Yeah. Now I, I have one of these. So tell us about this. This is called a lick mat. So the licky mats are the latest and the greatest, but yeah, you can put moist food on here and smear it on with a knife. Um, and same deal, they have to work at getting it off and you can make it more difficult by putting it in the freezer. This can help with anxiety because the licking motion it helps them calm themselves down plus the activity is mental stimulation which hopefully will and these are made out of food grade silicon so you know silicon is used heavily in the in the uh, Human. medical yep uh, and, and medical be because there's no reaction to the, no toxicity to the body whatsoever right so they're not licking something that's going to end up making them sick right What's the, what's the newest product that the customers are coming in and asking for? CBD, CBD, uh, CBD. <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, I, I think that's one of the greatest products out there. Yeah. I've seen nothing but good results, providing it's a good CBD and it's right. processed right. But that follows under a lot of the same things as we've been talking about. You have to know where that is sourced from, how it's grown, how it's processed, because this, there's so many steps that something can go awry with, mm -hmm. and you could be getting a product that's being touted as something, right? And it's not because one of those steps is bad. Yes. And that's another one I say U.S. U.S. source and U.S. Sure. processed. For sure. You know there are some companies out there with CBD oil, and I actually just lectured on this at SuperZoo uh, in in Las Vegas. There are some companies out there that grow it here, send it over to another country to process because it's cheaper. And, sh and shipping it back in order to sell it at a lesser price point. Mm -hmm. They lose control of that product once they send it over there. So you really have to know. What are some of the benefits you're seeing from CPD oil? Um, we are seeing it help with anxiety. We're seeing it help with seizures, um, aches and pains, arthritis. Appetite. Appetite yeah, for sometimes senior dogs, dogs. When they get older, they, they lose their, yep. their, their desire to eat a lot. So. Yeah, and, and what's interesting, some products now out there, although very few, are having something called CBG in there. And actually, CBD and THC are derived from CBG. CBG does the same effects as THC as far as health benefits with none of the high or the toxicity. So I actually see in the future going from CBD oil to high CBG with some CBD. Interesting. Let me interject this. THC is toxic and poisonous to your dog and your cat. You should never, ever give a CBD oil product that has THC in. And I think Tony would agree with that. Yes. Hey, 
that's at the end of our show. Tucker's snoring oh, wow. over here. <laughs> you know, he knows all this stuff already. <laughs> I want to thank Tony Shalaski from Healthy Pets Products for coming on the show and, and discussing the health and wellness of our pets. She's an expert in this. I, I, I love her store. She has three of them now. Give us her locations. Uh, South Hills on Washington Road, 3043 Washington Road. North Hills is on McKnight Road. And then Cranberry is 8001 Rowan Road. Thank you so much, Tony. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. You can, you can talk to me live every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock at AM 1250, the answer on my show, Healthy Pets, Healthy People. Thank you so much, everybody. Tony, thank you. Thanks. Show.